Midwest trying to advance to St. Louis. The Gators will open play against Trey Johnson and Jackson State, a high scoring guard. Then that 8 9 matchup, Arizona and Purdue looms. Butler with the great early season against ODU, who slid in there from the Colonial Athletic Association. Maryland gets a four seed in the Midwest. They'll take on Davidson. Notre Dame gets a very tough draw in the bottom half of the Midwest. Notre Dame, the sixth seed, and they get Winthrop, the game that Digger has been waiting for, the 6-11 matchup in the Midwest. Digger has said for much of the season Winthrop was going to win a game, and then here they go, getting the Eagles in the first round. Oregon played great, won the Pac-10 tournament, shot over 50% from behind the three-point arc, and they get Miami, Ohio. Miami, Ohio, the only automatic qualifier in the field with fewer than 20 wins. They knocked off Akron in the MAC. UNLV and Georgia Tech, Javaris Crittenden and that young Yellow Jacket team taking aim at Lon Kruger's club. And then Wisconsin getting the two seed in the Midwest. Those teams trying to make it to St. Louis. Wisconsin will open against Texas A&M Corpus Christi, a team that's been full-fledged Division I for only five years now and making it to the NCAA tournament for the first time out of the Southland. In the West, Kansas is the number one seed. The Jayhawks winning the Big 12 tournament title in a thriller over Texas. They will get the winner of the opening round game between Florida A&M and Niagara. And then another one of those dangerous second round matchups potentially after the 8-9 game between Kentucky and Villanova. Cats underachieved a little bit. Cats from Kentucky, I mean. And Villanova with the young guard Scotty Reynolds who can be explosive. Virginia Tech, the five seed out of the ACC gets Illinois. Illinois slipping into the tournament and Southern Illinois, a four seed regular season champions in the Missouri Valley Conference. Balker, Jamal Tatum leading them against Holy Cross. Bottom half of the West Regional, Duke for only the second time in 10 years, not a one or a two seed. In fact, as a six seed, the Devils, the lowest seed they've been since 1996. They get Virginia Commonwealth. Pitt is the three seed in the West. They open against Wright State out of the horizon. Indiana and Gonzaga in the 7-10 matchup. And UCLA with those two finishing losses, last regular season game and first game in the Pac-10 tournament. Did not get the one seed, but they will stay in the West as the two seed, and they open with Weaver State. In the top of the East, trying to make their way to East Rutherford for the regional semifinals. North Carolina is the top seed in the East, and I'll tell you, this part of the bracket is low dead. Tar Heels start with Eastern Kentucky, and then a second round matchup, assuming victory. And the winner of Marquette and Michigan State, Tom Crean against his old boss, Tom Izzo, in the 8-9 matchup. USC and Arkansas, Tim Floyd's team making it to the Pac-10 Tournament Championship game. The Hogs did likewise, both lost in their conference tournament title games. Arkansas, one of the last teams to make it into the field of 65, and Texas. Oh, my goodness. How do you like to be North Carolina? You're a one seed. Here's your reward. You might get Texas and Kevin Durant in the Sweet 16. Reggie Theus' team from New Mexico State is the 13th seed in that part of the bracket. Bottom half of the East. Vanderbilt, a sixth seed out of the SEC. Kevin Stallings team, very dangerous perimeter shooting team against the Athletic Club. Carl Hobbs, George Washington, the 11th seed. Washington State gets the three seed. They take on Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, a couple of seniors, very good players. Remember, this is a club that won at Kansas this year behind Caleb Green and Ken Touch. Green, a three-time Midcon Player of the Year, a force inside. Boston College and Texas Tech, the 7-10 matchup. Bob Knight can exhale as the Red Raiders make it into the field. And Georgetown, some would say this is a pretty good draw for the Hoyas. They open with Belmont, trying to make it to East Rutherford in the East. In the South, the number one seed, the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Ohio State with 30 wins behind Greg Oden. They open with CCSU. Central Connecticut State University from hard hit New Britain and Brigham Young and Xavier. Xavier might be a team that some of our guys have a bit of a beef with as they make it in despite not winning the A-10 tournament. Tennessee, a five seed. They open against Long Beach State in a 5-12 matchup. Six consecutive years. A 12 has beaten a five somewhere on the board. Might that be one that you select as you watch how America picks the games on ESPN.com on the side of the screen. And Virginia, great year under Dave Lado. They get a four seed in the South. They will open against the Greyhounds of Albany in the 4-13 game. Bottom half of the South, 
trying to make their way towards San Antonio. Louisville is the sixth seed, and Trent Johnson's Stanford team, despite an 18 and 12 record and early loss in the Pac-10 tournament, they make it into the field. Texas A&M early loss in the Big 12, slipping to a three seed. They'll open against the Ivy champions, the Penn Quakers. Nevada and Nick Fazekas against Creighton, the tournament champions from the Missouri Valley. Fazekas and Funk, two of the better names in the tournament, going head to head in the first round. Nate Funk, a fine player for Creighton and Memphis and North Texas. Johnny Jones getting the mean green into the field against John Calipari's team, which has now won 22 straight games. So that is the field of 65, and there are some notable omissions from there. So I guess the place to start, Jay, is what's your biggest beef? Well, my biggest beef is teams like Drexel and Syracuse and Florida State didn't get in when a team like Xavier did. And it's not to say that Xavier isn't deserving. I just don't think they're as deserving as teams like Drexel, which played an incredible road schedule. Uh, a team like Syracuse, which I think is just a better team than Xavier. And Florida State, which has beaten all the big shots that they've played. Now, Florida State may not have the same kind of resume as some of the top seeds in the tournament, but they've beaten teams like Florida. They won at Duke. They beat Maryland. But if you take a look at this uh, against Syracuse, Xavier's are. RPI may be just a little bit better, but I don't look at that at all. Look at their strength of schedule. Everybody says, uh, Syracuse doesn't play anybody. Syracuse doesn't go on the road. Syracuse doesn't do this. Well, their, their RPI uh, strength of schedule is better. They've won just as many games against the RPI top 50, and they didn't lose games to teams that Xavier lost to. Duquesne, Cincinnati, Rhode Island, St. Joe's, Bucknell, St. Louis, and Creighton. Those were the losses that Xavier had. Syracuse didn't lose to teams like those. They lost to teams of better quality, and they still had quality wins beating Georgetown, beating Villanova, winning on the road at Marquette. So to leave them out and also to leave Drexel out and Florida State at the expense of a team like Xavier, I don't think was the right thing by the committee. Well, I'm going to look at Arkansas, how they get in, why they get in. When you look at Arkansas's total season, 7-9 and nine in the SEC West, the Southeastern Conference, the West Conference was not that good. They go 18-12 and 12 on the season. Yes, they got to the championship game against Florida, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get in at large. The other side of the table, when I look at Kansas State from the Big 12, they got it done. They played, they won 10 games, lost 6, and I, and I know looking on paper, this is what people do. And you can look at all the things there, and you can say about strength and schedule and everything else, but Kansas State was 10-6 and six in their conference. They beat Texas Tech in a conference tournament like a playoff game by 21 points. And when I look at Arkansas and what? Texas Tech beat Arkansas big at Arkansas back earlier in the season. So I look at the strength of Texas Tech against Arkansas and Kansas State against Texas Tech, and I thought they earned their way in. That but, disappointed me. But it is a fair point to bring up Kansas State only have five wins against the top 100 in the RPI. But in the, I mean, conference, it's a Reese, in the conference tournament, they took care of business. And when you play that way and you win 10 games in the Big 12, I think 10-6 and six in any of the major conferences is good enough to but, get but in. But the but 10 like, weren't against the big shots. They, That's the problem. They play Texas, the, Texas an and schedule. And Texas Tech I'm defending only once. what they did no, as a conference. If I not arguing ten, with you, yeah. just making a different point. If I can get 10 and 6 in any major conference, I'm a very solid basketball team. And when I look at how they took care of Texas Tech, if you're going to compare games, Texas Tech played at Arkansas and destroyed them. And yesterday, we are two days ago, we saw what? Kansas State take care of business against Texas Tech. So if we're going to look at those three teams, in my opinion, I like what I saw in Kansas State with Cartier Martin. I think Bob Huggins has done a great coaching job with that team this year, okay. and I really thought that they should have gone in over in Arkansas. It's, it's a point of contention for sure, and certainly makes some great points. Huggins did do a great job with that team turning it around. What do you think, Huber? What's your biggest beat? I, I'm really surprised at Illinois that they're in the tournament. They were 9-7 and seven in the Big East, but they only played Ohio State and Wisconsin once during the season and when you looked at their resume they matched up perfectly against Purdue they were both nine and seven in the regular season they both lost uh, in the semifinals of the Big Ten tournament I thought they had to advance to the finals to even have a chance you look at their non-conference schedule they played a terrific non-conference schedule but they didn't beat anybody and for them I thought head-to-head -head matchup Purdue was going to get in because Purdue beat Illinois in the regular season to see Illinois in there and not have Drexel not have Syracuse teams that have beaten top teams. Syracuse has three wins in the top 25, and then you look at Illinois, they don't have any wins in the top 25. And none, of, none of these teams that we're talking about at the end of the line have better high-end wins in Florida State, and they weren't able to make it into the field. Dick Vitale is joining us now. Dick called the ACC tournament in the Tampa St. Pete area. Dick, what do you think? You've had a chance to see the field now. What's your biggest gripe? 
Well, my biggest gripe is I agree with Digger. I'm shocked that Arkansas is in. Seven and nine in a division that was totally mediocre, mediocre at best. Absolutely mediocrity existed there. How do you deny the kids from Drexel? Drexel and Syracuse should be in this field. Two teams, though, it's easy to say somebody should be in. Now you have to eliminate someone. So I would eliminate Arkansas. I thought the committee really had a tough task in front of them. I think they've done a great job, basically. But every year, there's one or two. I thought this year, when Drexel only gets three opportunities, basically, to play against quality teams, they come out on top. They go to Syracuse, they win. They go to Villanova, they win. They go to Creighton, they win. They win 23 games. How should those kids be denied? Syracuse beats Georgetown. I ask a simple question. Take some of these teams. Nothing against Xavier. Nothing against them at all. They had a great year in their conference. But if you take the Xavier's of the world, play them in the ACC, and see where they finish. If the criteria is the best 65 teams in America, there is no way that the kids from Tallahassee should not be in this tournament. Florida State belongs. They're one and four when they played without Douglas. He's back. They got five wins over teams in the top 50 of the RPI. They increased their schedule. They played against tougher teams. I thought a couple of injustices there, especially Drexel. Arkansas, yeah, they did great in their tournament. They got to the final. But what about looking at the total resume? Total resume, they absolutely, who did they beat? Okay, they beat West Virginia. They're not in the field. I'll give them, they beat Southern Illinois. But if you're in the SEC, you're supposed to beat Southern Illinois. Drexel got a raw, raw deal, and my heart feels for those kids. See, I, you know, that's a passionate argument. I don't disagree with it philosophically. But first of all, it's not the best 65 teams. It's the best 34 teams after the 31 at large as are in. There's a difference. And, and while you list wins for Drexel, look, I feel for those guys, too. They, they played their hearts out all year long. But while you're listing wins for teams, and they did have wins against Villanova, Creighton, and Syracuse, don't, don't forget this. They lost to Ryder, William & Mary, VCU twice, Old Dominion twice, Penn, all that stuff. They lost to Illinois. Didn't lose to teams like that. Illinois, I think, is a better team than Drexel. Now, you can argue Drexel can beat them on a given day. And that's the thing I want, I, you know, I, why I think Florida State should be in. If all these good teams can beat each other on a given day, which I think could be true, then show me how many given days you've had. And Florida State has had more given days than Drexel. I think Syracuse has had as many or, or more given days than, than, uh, than uh, Xavier has had. You know, Xavier should not be in at the expense of a team like Syracuse, at the expense of a team like Florida State. And I don't think you can make a case for Drexel being better than some of those teams. Not trying to imply that we have any influence over the committee, but I do think the one thing is that we probably gave Xavier a bit of a free pass after they lost in the no Atlantic question. 10 tournament. No we question. didn't discuss them quite as much as in at large. Okay, Doug Gottlieb is here with us as well. All right, Doug, uh, you have been looking at this and had a little while to look at the field of 65. What's your biggest beat? Well, I actually think that Syracuse shouldn't be in this tournament because if you allow Syracuse in the tournament, you have to allow Drexel in. Syracuse did nothing out of conference, and I think there's a clear message sent here. If you don't play anybody on the road in the non-conference, you better win the big games in your conference, and you better beat teams like St. John's at St. John's and UConn, who may not make the NIT at UConn. So I like that message that was sent. The one team that jumps out at me is Air Force. They were ranked in the top 25 the entire season. We all know the rankings don't mean anything, but you look at Texas Tech getting in, a team they beat on a neutral site by 14 points, and Stanford getting in. And I know Brooke Lopez didn't play, but they beat Stanford at Stanford by 34 points. If Air Force should get in last year, they should definitely get in this year. And the thing I think we're missing on about Xavier is the win over Illinois, the win over Villanova, the win over VCU. Those are three teams that are in the field. Xavier beat all of them, and they had won nine consecutive games before they lost in their conference tournament. All right, Doug, and joining us now on the phone is the head coach at Drexel, Bruiser Flint. Bruiser, what's your reaction to being left out of the field? I mean, you can only be disappointed. I mean, uh, I thought we did enough to uh, get ourselves a bid, but obviously we didn't. Uh, what message do you think? I mean, you scheduled a lot of road games. I think your non-conference schedule was rated as the fifth toughest. You won all of those road games. What message do you take away from this, scheduling that way in the non-conference, yet not getting into the field? Uh, it says to you that uh, your, your body of work is not as, as important as they say it is, <laughs> to be honest with you. So uh, maybe you don't go and schedule yourself like that. Uh, maybe you try to get as many wins as you possibly can. Uh, and if you can do that, 
uh, you know, one thing that's tough for us is you be caught between a rock and a hard place because we can't get a lot of home games. We can't play people at, at, in our building. People don't come to our building. So you do have to go out and play a lot of road games and try to win some games that way. Uh, you know, we did. We had true road games. We didn't play any neutral sites tournaments. We went to people's places and played. And uh, it wasn't good enough for the for the committee. And now we just got to get ready uh, to play in the next tournament. Uh, Bruiser, how would you respond though to those who said, "Sure, the non-conference portion was good enough, but the conference portion of your schedule was not," because you finished back in the standings in fourth place? How would you respond? Yeah, we finished in fourth place. We won 13 games. We had three teams uh, in front of us that won the most games they've ever won in the league. I mean, uh, what do they want us to do? It's the most wins we've ever won in the league. Uh, you know, what they're pretty much telling us is you should have won your conference. So, so, so that's it right there. And uh, I mean, I don't know what to say. I really don't. I'm disappointed for my kids. I feel like I said before. I thought we did enough to get get by. I thought our body of work uh, uh, spoke for itself, uh, but it just wasn't good enough. Bruiser. Thanks a lot for taking some time to be with us. I know it's a disappointing night for you. Best of luck to you in the rest of the postseason. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Bruiser Flint, the head coach at Drexel. These are the bubbles who are burst. The last six teams not to make the field, Air Force and Drexel. And Florida State we've talked a bit about. Also spoken of the other three, Kansas State, Syracuse, and West Virginia, all just missing the NCAA tournament. Much more about the burst bubbles, about the number one seeds, about the matchups in the first round when Bracket rolls on. Guys, printers out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. If you could travel like this, for the same price as this, why wouldn't you? It's the same with auto insurance. With discounts up to 40%, it's possible to get the personal service of a State Farm agent for the same or less than those other guys. Call an agent 24-7 or visit statefarm.com. I used to think it didn't matter what deodorant I chose. Dumb. This test shows that Old Spice is the right choice. Take the Old Spice challenge. I did. It's a beautiful day inside. Temperature about 71 degrees with the air conditioning. The number one player in the world making his way to the tee box. Looks like Tiger's got a turkey avocado sandwich. I make them all the time, Jim. Wow. Look at the gallery. You can sense the electricity. Tiger Woods, PGA Tour 07. Ready for everyone. EA Sports. It's in the game. is presented by Staples. That was easy. And in part by State Farm. Great service, great rates. It's all here. Nobody takes care of you like State Farm. And Old Spice Red Zone.
if Florida is to follow the path of 91-92 Duke Blue Devils and repeat as national champions, this is the path they'll have to follow to get to the Sweet 16. Arizona and Purdue, the 8-9 matchup in New Orleans on Friday. Butler is the 5 seed in the Midwest with Maryland getting the 4. The Terrapins get Davidson in the 4-13 matchup and Butler against Old Dominion in the 5-12. Remember, we've had six straight years in which at least 1-12 has beaten a five. So the Mighty Gators on top in the Midwest, the number one seed, Dick Vitale joining us now. Dick, what are your thoughts on that part of the bracket? Well, you know, you look up there, I'd look at Florida, that second round game could be a dangerous game. I'll tell you, if Arizona gets by Purdue, I think they got enough firepower to spring a major, major surprise there. It wouldn't really shock me. Arizona's talented enough to beat anybody in America. So that's a danger game. Get by that, they're probably looking at the Terps of Maryland. Not going to be an easy run for them. I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be easy going back to back like Duke did in 91-92, despite how well they played in the tournament right now and won the SEC. Well, I, and you know, I look at that matchup in the first round with Arizona and Purdue, and, and, and you know, Dick Vitale, you talked about Purdue. Arizona is absolutely uh, terrific in terms of talent on the offensive end, but where they have struggled is on the defensive end. They've got a great point guard in Mustafa Shakur, but look at the matchup down low with Ivan Radinovic, and for looking for Purdue, Carl Landry, a guy that just continues to improve in terms of points and rebounds. Arizona's going to have to slow this place down. They're going to have to play terrific defense, but I look for Purdue winning that game. Purdue has won seven out of their last ten games prior to losing to the semifinals in the Big Ten. This is a team that continues to get better, and that's going to be a great first-round matchup. All right, when you look at your first 5-12 upset, let's go with Old Dominion over Butler. Yeah, Butler won the preseason NIT. Mike Green, A.J. Graves are great guards, got it done. But Old Dominion has a case when they look at now from the Colonial Conference, which George Mason came from last year, can they get it done? Drew Williamson and company know they won at Georgetown. Yes, it was back in November, but we know how good Georgetown is now. They finished 15-3 in the conference. They won 12 in a row before they lost to George Mason. This will be a very dangerous game for Butler, who lost the right state and got in as an at-large. So this is one game when I look at the 5-12 upsets, I'm going with Old Dominion to get it done. You know, a couple other upsets to look for. The 10-7 game, Georgia Tech over UNLV. UNLV, I think, got that 7 seed simply because of its RPI numbers. They've had a terrific year. They're a very good defensive team. They have trouble scoring a little bit. So I would take Georgia Tech in that game. I think another one to look for is Davidson, I think, is good enough to give Maryland a scare and possibly an upset. Stephen Curry, an outstanding Standing score, 21 points per game. His father, of course, Del Curry, the great NBA player, also played at Virginia Tech in college. And Jason Richards, an outstanding point guard as well. But watch out for Oregon, the number three seed. Oregon could wind up in the Final Four. They're that talented on the perimeter. They've got solid inside play with Marty Lunen. That's a really good basketball team. If they play anywhere close to the way they played in the Pac-10 tournament, I would be very frightened of Oregon. And I know Digger's been talking about Winthrop a lot. They drew Notre Dame in that first round game. And one of the reasons Winthrop has a chance to win is not because because their guards, which are very good with Terrell Martin and, uh, and Michael Jenkins, but they've got solid big guys. That's the reason George Mason made it to the Final Four last year. Wasn't just because of their guards, but because they had guys like Will Thomas inside and Jai Lewis. And watch out for guys like Philip Williams and Craig Bradshaw for Winthrop because they're the guys that could make the difference in a first round game against Notre Dame. And as you look at the bottom half of that bracket in the Midwest that Jay has alluded to, the Notre Dame Winthrop matchup at 6 11 is certainly a compelling one. Winthrop very close to knocking off Tennessee in the first round last year. No team from the Big South has ever won a first round game. Oregon and Miami, Ohio. Miami, Ohio, the Red Hawks, the only team in the field as an automatic qualifier with fewer than 20 victories. Vegas and Georgia Tech, Wisconsin opens up against Texas A&M. Corpus Christi, Dick Vitale back now. This is the bottom half of the Midwest, Dick. What are your impressions of that portion of the bracket? Well, you know, Reese, everybody's going to focus on a game with Winthrop and Notre Dame, and everybody's expecting that to be certainly right now. Everybody, including yours truly, has been singing the praises of Winthrop and their ability to shoot the three, went to overtime with Wisconsin, played a tough game against North Carolina. Saying all that, Mike Bray and his kids are going to find a way to win that game. I look for the Golden Domers to march on, setting up a matchup against Oregon, and then I think Oregon with Brooks, Taylor, and company too strong. Oregon will be their nemesis in the second round, but they will get by Winthrop. 
or I'm looking at the first round and that matchup with Coach Phelps talking about Notre Dame and Winthrop. And if you look at Notre Dame, this team just continues to get better. You saw them in the Big East tournament. They have an outstanding point guard in Torrey Jackson, a guy that can get into the middle, make plays, distribute the basketball. They've got great shooters in Colin Falls and Russell Carter. And these guys are down low. They have an undersized Luke Herringoti at 6'7", who can get points in the paint. And Jay is right. When you look at Winthrop, they have been to the NCAA tournament the last two years. They should have beaten Tennessee last Last year in the NCAA tournament, they have a great shooter in Terrell Martin, but they also have size, Craig Bradshaw, and that in a mid-major is very rare to have guys that can get points into the paint. That is a very tough first-round matchup. Let's talk about a 7-10 game when you look at Georgia Tech taking on who? UNLV. UNLV is a very strong team. Got a lot of things going on for themselves. Some guy named Kevin Kruger, whose dad is Lon Kruger, the coach, and Wink Adams, as well as Wendell White. Very solid defensive team, but Georgia Tech has been on a mission. This young team has really matured. Thaddeus Young, Darius Crittenden, and I just feel that their defense and the way they've exploded, they played very well at the end of the season and dangerous in the league, had some big wins at home, big wins on the road, and Georgia Tech, to me, is one of those teams that, as I look at that 10-7 upset, Georgia Tech's on a mission as young as they are. And one of the reasons is Georgia Tech's playing more physical. I mean, they've been knocking people around, especially their inside guys. They're handing out a lot of bruises in there, and that's going to be a big difference when they play UNLV. Yeah, Mountain West Conference has gotten a lot of bruises since its advent. They've only won five tournament games in 21 tries, five and 16 as a conference in the NCAA tournament with only one team making it as far as the Sweet 16. So UNLV hoping to change that against Georgia Tech a little bit. Georgia Tech with a talented freshman. Crittenden, Thaddeus Young starting to mature as the season got a little deeper. They won a couple of games late in the season to solidify their bid. Home game against North Carolina and then against Boston College as well. We'll continue breaking down the bracket, look at upsets. We'll continue to see what you think. You can log on to ESPN.com and fill out America's bracket. Ohio State, 30 wins, a Big Ten tournament title. We'll show you the Buckeyes' path when we come back. I'm not going to throw my hard-earned money away. I'm going to put it in, like, a bond or savings account, not tied up into some crazy convertible. Shoot. You know why they make the roofs go down, don't you? To make it easier for you to throw your money out of them. Go back to the beginning with the Dudes on the unrated DVD. See their first car. Woo! And their first time. I don't know what all the fuss is about. Well, you're missing 99% of your pants. Oh! Buy the Dukes of Hazard, the beginning unrated. Tuesday on DVD. The journey begins on Selection Monday. ESPN is live and exclusive. There it is! With complete bracket analysis. She has really elevated this team to not just a good team, but a great team. Team reactions and championship predictions. I think they're a Final Four quality team. From the tournament draw to the final buzzer. We'll take you there. NCAA Women's Basketball Selection Special, Monday at 8, on e My name is Amy. I'm a single mom. When I saw this place for sale, it just looked homey. Refinished all the floors, all new windows, five stitches there, plenty of splinters. There are those projects that are three trip to the Home Depot, the five trip, or there could even be the 10 trip. They know their stuff. I went from feeling like I really couldn't do anything else to feeling like I can do whatever I want. If my girls do have heroes, I'd love to be one of them. You've got to get there for an extra thousand dollars off a new Toyota. Five days, ten different models. Get an extra thousand dollars off your best deal on any new 07 Corolla, Matrix, Solara, Avalon, or Sienna. You've got to get there for an extra thousand dollars off any new 07 Forerunner, Sequoia, Tacoma, or Highlander, including Highlander Hybrid, over and above all other factory incentives. But you've got to use it or lose it by March 12th. See your Northern Ohio Toyota dealers before it all ends Monday. Tom. Fred Hickman here with the Sports Center 30 at 30 update. And we've got news from the NHL to report. Islanders left wing Chris Simon has been suspended for a league record 25 games, including the playoffs, after close lining Ryan Holweg with his stick last Thursday. The 25 game penalty the longest in league history. And Dante Stallworth, the free agent wide receiver late of the Eagles, has reached terms with the New England Patriots, according to Michael Smith of ESPN.com. Six years, over 30 million. Next Sports Center after the Mavs Lakers, 24 7 sports on ESPN News.
If Greg Oden is one and done, what a one it has been for Ohio State. 30 victories, the number one seed in the South, Big Ten regular season and tournament title. Buckeyes will open play on Thursday at Lexington KY against Central Connecticut State. BYU and Xavier Keenan Young, Austin Ainge leading the Cougars against the controversial selection out of the Atlantic 10. Chris Lofton in Tennessee against Long Beach State. Virginia with their great guard Singletary and Reynolds opening against Albany out of the America East. Dick Vitale is here now. And Dick, as you look at that half of the bracket, looks like pretty clear sailing for the Buckeyes. What do you think? Well, you know, I think the Buckeyes are going to be too strong for anybody in the top half. I really think you're going to see Greg Oden at his best. I think you're going to see them play super basketball defensively, and I think defense prevails at tournament time, and the Medak gives them a great edge. With their quickness, Michael Conley at the point guard slot, I don't see anybody beating them on the top half. I look at Albany playing Virginia. Virginia has got some guard shooting problems. Albany's a team that took Connecticut and almost upset them last year in the NCAA tournament. But Virginia's guards, 9 for 31 in that loss to NC State. Sean Singletary, J.R. Reynolds, yeah, they may score 21 points, but they'll take a lot of shots to do it. I don't think they can get away with that in the NCAA tournament, especially in the first matchup against Albany. So when you look at what's going to take Virginia out, it'll be poor shooting by their guards, and if they don't get that defense going to compensate that Virginia Ju Virginia can get knocked out yeah I look at that first round matchup with BYU and Xavier and you look at Brigham Young they have a terrific inside and outside punch with Trent Blaisted and Austin A. Ainge uh, Blaisted is a terrific guy in terms of uh, power forward and get points in the paint he can also step out on the perimeter and knock down that perimeter jump shot but this is a great opportunity for Xavier to pro prove themselves everyone's been talking about they shouldn't have gotten a free pass into the NCAA tournament after losing early in the Atlantic 10 conference tournament this is a team that has a great point guard and Drew Lavender, a transfer from Oklahoma, a guy that can really get after defensively, distribute the basketball. They don't have big uh, uh, post players, but they have guys that can versatile, can shoot from the three like Josh Duncan and Justin Dolman. What a great matchup and an opportunity to prove yourself here in the first round. Yeah, and they have an older team, and they're going to have to they're gonna have to stop Keenan Young. I think he's BYU's best player and their best scorer. I think one of the, the intriguing teams there is the number five team in Tennessee. Now, Tennessee has already played Ohio State earlier this year, played them down to the end of the game at Ohio State. And because they've got Chris Lofton, a guy that can get 30-plus on you any given day, and they can really get up and down the floor. Their freshman guards are playing. Jawan Smith playing much better than he did earlier in the season. Ramar Smith as well. If they can get past Long Beach State, and Long Beach State is a pretty solid team out of the Big West. They've got the Big West Player of the Year in Aaron Nixon, a guy that can really play. I think that Tennessee is a team that could give a good scare to Ohio State because they can speed the tempo of that game, and they can move Greg Oden away from the basket. If you remember that first matchup, they ran a lot of high pick and roll and pulled Greg Oden away and were able to come off that, kick it out to open shooters and get some good things. There have been very few teams late in the season that have had the chops to pull Oden away from the paint because he covers up the basket inside of 12 feet, blocking shots and changing shots in the lane. All right, Ohio State with the number one seed. Tennessee and Long Beach State, the Vols might need to get out of that first round exactly. there, but then once they get there, it <laughs> might, be, might be a good matchup again. They took them right down to the wire, and Columbus, as Jay mentioned. We'll look at the rest of the South. We'll look at Memphis. Memphis, a team on a 22-game winning streak, but not much competition in Conference USA. How will that affect them in their tournament run? We'll discuss. these walls could talk, they'd tell you that in this game, nothing is out of bounds. They'd tell you there's nowhere to hide. They'd tell that guy in 2G to stop spilling his drink on them. They'd wince, they'd cheer, they'd scream in terror, they'd ask to see a doctor. If these walls could talk, they'd say you have to see it to believe it. Russell Athletic, ESPN Arena Football, Los Angeles Avengers versus Orlando Predators, Monday at 7 p.m. on ESPN2. Hey guys, printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. I mean, why would you ask me out? Clearly, this is the package that you were drawn to. And then, what? Let's put the top down? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> because I have a lot invested here. I know that this looks effortless. I go to America! <laughs>
If you thought Borat was outrageous in theaters... Okay, okay, good, good. Well, I'm not used to that, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Wait until you see it on DVD. On the baby! Now, Borat comes with 30 minutes of outrageous footage you didn't see in theaters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. King in the castle, king in the castle. <laughs> Don't miss out. Get Borat on DVD today. It's nice. I changed my oil. Why worry about engine sludge? You can't see sludge coming, but it can rob gas mileage and hold your car back. Yeah, right. Castrol GTX has a powerful formula to stop sludge in its tracks. Give me a burger, fries. GTX's unique dispersants neutralize sludge for superior protection among leading 5W and 10W30s. And some extra napkins. Castrol GTX. It's more than just oil. It's liquid engineering. Welcome back to ESPNU Bracketology. Presented by Staples. Took a look at the top half of the South bracket where Ohio State is the number one seed. In the bottom half of the South, Memphis is the two seed. They'll open against North Texas. Three seed in the South is Texas A&M. They have the champions of the Ivy and Penn. Nevada and Creighton, 7-10. Louisville, Stanford. Uh, this is a little bit of a mystery half of the bracket, it seems, Jay. And it's a difficult half of the bracket. This bottom half has a lot going on for Memphis, the number two seed. Now, Memphis didn't play as difficult to schedule this year as they played last year, but they're still a very explosive and a very good basketball team that plays a drive-and-kick style, an open floor style. They take what some people would consider bad shots. Now, the one thing they don't do particularly well is shoot free throws. They've got to get consistent guard play. But if in the second round they wind up playing a team like Nevada, Nevada's got the chops to beat a team like Memphis because they have solid point guard play from Iran Sessions. They've got a star in Nick Fizikas, and they've got a guy that can hang 30 on you in Marcellus Kemp. Now, they've got an injury. Kyle Shiloh hurt himself in their tournament. He may not be available for the remainder of the season, but Nevada's got the chops to win. Another game to watch is that 11-6 matchup. Louisville, the sixth seed, taken on Stanford, and Louisville has struggled, if at all, this season late in the year when they've been playing very well. They've struggled with size, and Stanford has got size. And I'm telling you one thing. Brooke Lopez from Stanford, a freshman. We're going to be talking in five years that he's going to be creeping up to Greg Oden. That's how good this kid's going to be. Offensively, is outstanding. He's making strides defensively. He's going to be a great player. Yeah, and that's the matchup I'm talking about in the first uh, in the first round when you look at um, uh, Louisville and Stanford. Louisville, you're talking about their big guys. They have gotten healthy in terms of David Pageant and Derek Character. These guys have been consistent down low in the latter part of the season, are getting points in the paint and also rebounding the basketball. They have an outstanding point guard and Edgar Sosa to knock down threes and also penetrate. When you look at Stanford, this is a team that was 10-8 and eight in the Pac-10. They're playing extremely well right now because they have their starting point guard, Anthony Goods, back. And, and Jay talked about it. Those Brooke Lopez, Robin Lopez, these guys right now are playing extremely well down low on the post. They can rebound, they can score, they can step out to the high post and knock down that perimeter jump shot. What a great matchup down low between Louisville and Stanford in the first round. And another three seed, Texas A&M, is going to be really scary in that bracket because Texas A&M has got great guard play with A.C. Law. He's a guy that can take over a game. And we've talked about teams that, are, that have great players that can take over in the NCAA tournament. That's another three seed. We talked about Oregon being a three seed that could get to the Final Four. Another three seed is Texas A&M. A&M probably thought it was going to have a two seed, but the early stumble in the Big 12 tournament might have cost them. Dick Vitale back with us now. Dick, your thoughts about the South now and the path at Ohio State and, and the path at Memphis as a two seed might have to follow. Well, you know, Reese, I look at that down there, and I think Memphis, you know, 22 games in a row. John Calipari did a great job. He lost so much from last year. Players moving on to the NBA. But when I look at it down there, his reward, that second-round game, I think that could be the end for Memphis. I think that Nevada with Kemp and certainly with Masikas, they defend very well. They score. They got a star player to make big plays at the end of the game. I think that is a tough matchup. Louisville, I love Rick Pitino. At tournament time at tournament time take a look at certain coaches you watch coaches that can motivate inspire in a one game scenario I go edge to Louisville for that factor the diaper dandy down there at Stanford is going to be a special player as Jay said but I still like Louisville coming out of the Big East I like the way they finish and I think that Rick Pitino and Tom Izzo and coaches the Mike Krzyzewski's in that le section when he plays Pittsburgh, et cetera, in the second round. Watch the coach. These guys win at tournament time in one-game scenarios.
It's going to be a very dangerous 7-10 matchup. Creighton as a 10. You got Nevada as a 7. Nevada lost last year to Montana in the first round. Yes, Nick Vizica is back. Shiloh's out. We don't know how long he's going to be out with that injury. But Nate Funk and company, Creighton is a very dangerous team coming out of that Missouri Valley. They were 13-5 and five in the conference. They knocked off Xavier back in December. But well coached. They have the discipline. And they know what they can do as a surprise element when you go up against a team like Nevada who didn't win that first round last year. Nick Mazikas came back, but he's going to find out. If they're not focused at Creighton, they can lose that game. Schedule overall, if you start looking at top 50, top 25 types of games, Nevada hasn't been tested in that regard as much as some of the other teams. be interesting to see how they react to that. Doug Gottlieb back with us now. Doug, you have a beef with the South at all? I absolutely do. I have two beefs with the South. One, Louisville, a six seed playing in Lexington. Now, uh, I don't have a, a graph in front of me. I don't have a chart in front of me. But I knew, do know that I think Lexington is about 45 minutes or so from Louisville. How do you get protected in the first and second round playing that close to home when you're a six seed? That one, that one jumps out at me. And for Texas A&M, how about this? If they can get past, let's say, Louisville in the second round, assuming Louisville could beat Stanford, Texas A&M would have a virtual home game in San Antonio against Memphis or maybe Ohio State. They might even cancel spring football practice to see <laughs> Texas A&M play in San Antonio. It could be it could be the roadblock they put up in front of Louisville, those two big Lopez twins that you guys have been right. talking about. That's hey, right. one and done in the house that Patino That's used right. to own, and now will just be visiting. North Carolina grabbing a number one seed after their impressive performance in the ACC tournament. We will break down the Tar Heels path when we come back on Bracketology. Hey guys, printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. chocolate phone with a new two-year activation on a Verizon wireless plan of $39.99 or more. A free phone from the pizza that gives you more. Can I hold it? No. Want more? Get America's favorite pizza, Pizza Hut. What is victory? Is it when you've won more titles than anyone else? Or is the greatest achievement of all building a foundation for yourself so you can become one for someone else? Go, Bella. Keep pedaling. Keep pedaling. So he sent me the most beautiful bouquet ever. Wow. Yeah. What the cards say? Only something beautiful for my something beautiful. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I know. Everyone here has been joking. He must have done something really bad. <laughs> you don't think... <laughs> you don't think he could have... Oh... Singular is now the new AT&T. Your world delivered. I got it. I got it. I, whoa! Oh, what's wrong with me? <sighs> You've got sports video deficiency, Jimmy. Bill Walton? You need ESPN 360. Wow. It's the game and everything around it, including real-time stats, in-depth historical analysis, and more. And it's all at your control, Jimmy. Together, Together we, we can, can fight sports video deficiency. deficiency. And watch live games. <laughs> <laughs> Log, Log on, on now. now.
Yet another virtuoso performance by Kevin Durant. Fourth time this season he scored 37 points in a game, but the Horns fell in the Big 12 title game to Kansas. Texas draws the fourth seed in the East, but North Carolina is the top seed. Boy, this is a this is a tough road to hoe for the Tar Heels, just trying to get to the Elite Eight with Texas and maybe USC looming a second-round game against the Marquette Michigan State winner. Uh, Dick Vitale again. Uh, Dickie V, I tell you, this might be the most loaded portion of the bracket. I'll tell you one thing. You look up there, you see Marquette, Michigan State, Tom Crean and Tom Izzo. Certainly Tom Izzo's had loads of success in the postseason. The question is, is he good enough to defend the guards when you look at Marquette? James is going to have to be super in that game and certainly dominate. He's going to have to step up. On the other side, they're going to have to neutralize Neitzel. But you look at North Carolina. I had them today, Reese. They're playing well defensively. Tyler Hansborough had the mask. I thought it bothered him tremendously. Offensively, he was very impressive. They got so many weapons. Lawson's really playing well. I look at that. I think that region's tough. I think the toughest region is the West. I think the West is flat out loaded, but I think this one, when you look from top to bottom, is pretty tough as well. The 5-12 matchup with Southern Cal against Arkansas. Arkansas lost Charles Thomas, who had 18 points, 18 rebounds, and that big win over Mississippi State. They only played one minute today, sprained his ankle. They'll need his status upgraded to healthy. But when you look at Southern Cal, yes, they got blown out by who? Oregon put on a clinic when you look at how they won that Pac-10 championship game. Nick Young can solid play in the perimeter. Todd Gibson, the freshman, is really matured, a double-double guy in that front line. And I really think this team, when you look at Southern Cal with Tim Floyd, they play solid team defense, and this could be one team, Southern Cal, that really makes a difference in what they're trying to do to move forward past Arkansas. Yeah, Coach, look at this 8-9 matchup, and these are two teams that we have seen before in Marquette and, and Michigan State. Marquette is guard-heavy. I mean, they're absolutely terrific. And when you look at Dominique James, a guy that really plays well into a pick-and-roll situation, he can knock down perimeter jump shots, get into the lane. It's going to be interesting to see if Jarrell McNeil is going to be healthy for them. But you look at M Michigan State, uh, I've picked them throughout the entire year because I absolutely <laughs> love every Drew Knight. Every game, and Drew Knight, he has to be the most improved player in the country, a guy that really can take over in late game situations but why I like Michigan State there is because they have size they go on Sutan Marquise Gray guys that aren't particularly you can throw the ball down low on the post and manufacture points but they are terrific in getting rebounds and playing big down low for Michigan State can they guard the pick and roll action of Marquette that will be a key for them I think they can guard it one it's going to be like looking in a mirror <laughs> yeah, <for right>. <laughs> <laughs> both of them run 60 70 sets and they're going to know what each other runs but how about the coaches in this you know Roy Williams Tom Crean Tom Izzo, Rick Barnes, 11 Final Fours, two national championships between them. I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, North Carolina, their reward for being a number one seed is in the Sweet 16, they get Texas. <laughs> and Texas can roll up 95 points on. That's going to be an up and down game if those two teams make it that far. And I agree with Hubert. I think one of the things for Marquette is Jarrell McNeil with that thumb on his shooting hand. Is he going to be available to play? If he is, he's a guy that gets deflections, gets loose balls, gets rebounds. He's a courageous driver to the basket, and he can make a difference in that first round game against Michigan State. The other game I look to, which I think is going to be a great game, is USC-Arkansas. I mean, I'm not sure that Southern Cal is going to have the size, depending upon if Charles Thomas is healthy to play in that game. You know, I saw Charles Thomas this summer at the Nike All-American camp up in Indianapolis, and he said to me, he goes, you're going to be talking about me next year on the selection show. And code. now you and are. We are. So Barely. He, he just had 18 <laughs> points, 18 rebounds against Mississippi State. If he's healthy, he's going to give Southern Cal a handful in Taj Gibson. They also have a terrific point guard in Gary Irvin, transfer from Mississippi State, and also Patrick Beverly, who was a freshman of the year in the SEC, and Stan Heath's team barely getting in, extending the SEC's run of having at least five bids to ten straight years. So that is the top half of the East bracket. In the bottom half of the East, Vanderbilt gets the sixth seed. Jay, are you surprised Vanderbilt wasn't a little bit closer to the bubble? I'm a little bit surprised because they did have some bad losses as well, losing to Furman and Appalachian State, things like that. Washington State is the three seed in the East. These teams trying to make it to East rather for the regional semifinals. Boston College hanging with the seven. Bob Knight's team slipping in there after an embarrassing loss in the Big 12 tournament that perhaps pushed the Red Raiders a little bit closer to the edge and their fans would have liked Georgetown the two seed out of the east Dick what do you think of this portion of the east bracket 
Well, you got to like the Hoyas when you look at them right now with that great size with Hibbert and Green. Green's been absolutely phenomenal. They're 15 and 1. The only loss to Syracuse. And Jimmy Beheim, you got a legitimate argument, baby. I'll tell you this when you look at the Hoyas, they're going to be tough to beat. Also, Vanderbilt, the way they can shoot the three, Byers has been sensational. Look for Vanderbilt to win their first two rounds and knock out Washington State. I really like that Vanderbilt team. I think they're a very dangerous team and they can fly flat out shoot the perimeter shot and Byers is a star yep. how they let him get away from Virginia is beyond me <laughs> I know I, I agree with you with Vanderbilt they're a terrific shooting basketball team you look at Shan Foster a guy uh, has great size at the shooting guard position at 6'7 he can get his shot off against anyone and you talk about Derek Byers uh, he had to be in the running for Big 12 um, um, player of the year I mean this guy's been absolutely terrific uh, they're playing against a George Washington team that played in their game and they were terrific. They were 16 and 0 in their conference last year. They have terrific guard play in Maurice Rice and Carl Elliott. So it's going to be a great matchup between them. But when you look at Vanderbilt, if they can knock down their three-point jump shots, they're a terrific defensive team. This is a team that can go a couple rounds and play extremely well. 10-7 matchup. How about the Boston College with Bob Knight and Texas Tech? Texas Tech's guards got to play very, very well in this game. We look at Jerry Jackson as well as Martin Zeno. They've got to control the game. They've got to be smart on the perimeter. The issue will be is how can they stop inside game of what BC brings to the table? Jared Dudley, Sean Marshall, and Tyrese Reese on the, on, the, on the perimeter. I just think this is going to be a tough matchup unless Bob Knight decides to play some 2-3 zone. Doubt it. Yeah, he's not going to play any 2-3 zone, but you take a look at those two, two players you're talking about. Jarius Jackson, over 2,000 points in his career, moves very well without the ball, comes off those down screens, fade screens, likes to curl and cut to the basket. And Jared Dudley is so good in that tight flex that they run. He can step away, knock down shots. I'm not sure that Texas Tech has any individual matchup that can guard Jared Dudley. And the one thing that Texas Tech struggles with a little bit is mental and physical toughness. And in order to beat Boston College, you've got to have mental and physical toughness. This is going to have to be the toughest mentally that Texas Tech perhaps has been all season long because they're playing away from home where they've struggled a little bit. But, you know, Dick was saying that, that Washington State may get clipped. One team that may clip them is Oral Roberts. And right. Oral Roberts has Caleb Green, as you mentioned, the three-time Midcon Player of the Year. One thing Caleb Green can do better than any player in this tournament is get to the free throw line. Washington State cannot foul him or he will shoot 15 to 20 free throws. Caleb Green and Ken Tutt have each scored over 2,000 points in their career. Only seven sets of teammates have been able to do that. And Tutt's 2,000 point came on the game winner in the Midcon tournament. Let's not forget that number two seed, Georgetown. They showed a lot of big stuff in that Big East Conference tournament. And Georgetown's going to be very, very dangerous peeping up on people. Roy Hibbert really had that big double-double. And we know what Jeff Green can do. I like how Georgetown, everybody's talking about all these other teams. Georgetown's the one team that could sneak up to a lot of teams and end up maybe in a final. Uh, I think that part of the bracket's wide open for Georgetown. Yeah. Georgetown is yeah. in, it, they're going to the regional final. The yeah. question yeah. is, is it going to be Texas? Is it going to be North Carolina? Who's going to play them? Yeah. Georgetown's getting there. Some underrated star power in that part of the bracket, too. Jeff Green that you mentioned, Big East Player of the Year. Derek Byers, SEC Player of the Year in some quarters. Also, Jared Dudley, yep. ACC Player of the Year. Let's go back to the top part of that bracket now. And Arkansas getting in as a 12 seed after their run in the SEC tournament. Doug, agree or do disagree with the tournament selection committee's decision. I totally disagree. I mean, you go 2 and 8 on the road and at home they weren't that good. Lost at home to Tennessee and to Kentucky and to Georgia in addition to some of those early losses. Really pathetic road team. I understand they played well late, but let's be honest, they didn't play well enough today. They didn't look like a tournament team. I understand Thomas was out hurt, but how can you This goes back to the Drexel argument. Team wins 13 road games and you win 2 and you ask any of those guys sitting next to you on the set the most difficult thing to do is not just win on the road, but win on the road in guarantee game situations, which is exactly what Drexel did. If I'm the Drexel Dragons, the one team I point to that shouldn't be in the field, and we should, is this team, is Arkansas. And Arkansas's two big wins over the last week have both been against Vanderbilt, and I think Jay and I both agree they're badly overseeded. This is a Vanderbilt team that lost to Furman early. Uh, they lost to Wake Forest in a game that wasn't close. They do shoot a lot of threes, so sometimes they shoot poorly. I, I think that Arkansas shouldn't be in and, and Vanderbilt badly overseeded.
So, but when you make an argument for Drexel or something like that, then you're arguing for a team that beat Ryder or that lost to Ryder, lost to William and Mary, Penn. lost to Penn, lost to VCU twice, lost to Old Dominion. So, I mean, we're talking about teams that have all proven they can lose, and Arkansas proved they can beat some, beat some people. Now, reasonable minds can differ on this. They're deserving teams, and I'm not saying Drexel is not deserving or Syracuse wasn't deserving, but uh, you know, Arkansas is good enough to be in this tournament. Yeah, five and one on neutral court. But Doug mentioned the road record was not great. The SEC, the top or second ranked conference all season long. So Arkansas able to slip in by virtue largely of their late run in the SEC tournament. We'll continue here on Bracketology. Maybe one of the hottest teams around in the late part of the season. The Jayhawks who've been rocking and chalk outlining just about everybody in their path. Though Texas has given them plenty of trouble. We'll talk about the Jayhawks in a bit. Hey guys, printers out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. N-O, as in no, Stan. We are not getting a convertible. What are you going to want next, huh? An amp? <laughs> that is rich. Hey, CP. Yeah. What do you think you go for tonight? 16? 17? No, I think I'm going to go for 28. 28? You ever get that before? Yeah, last year in Washington. All right. Good luck with that. Feeling brave, huh? Yeah. Uh, 12, 16, and 28. Yeah. Spicy Kung Pao chicken. Right. Thanks. 15 minutes. Enjoy the ultimate theater experience in your own home. Let AudioVisions make your place the destination for movie night, game day, or anytime with a custom top-of-the-line theater system. Our expert consultants and installers will help create the perfect system for you from audio and video equipment to furniture and entertainment centers. AudioVisions is also the leader in mobile theater systems. Call or visit AudioVisions at Strongsville, Solon, Canton, and now in the Promenade at Crocker Park in Westlake. At O'Brien Chevrolet is where buying a new Chevrolet is as easy as buying a shirt at your local discount store. You pick out the one you want, in the color you want, and you pay the low upfront price that's already marked on the windshield. Just add tax and tag and you're out the door. No gimmicks, no games. And since we're your regional Chevrolet superstore, you'll find the area's best selection at Pat O'Brien East off I-90 on Bishop Road in Willoughby Hills and West at Detroit and Columbia off I-90 in Westlake. Back on our Bracketology show, the number one seed in the West, the Kansas Jayhawks. They'll play the winner of the opening round game between FAMU and Niagara. And then Kentucky and Villanova in this part of the bracket, Virginia Tech and Illinois, and Southern Illinois, and Holy Cross. Your, your impressions, Jay, of this part of the bracket? You know, I know Dick Vitale said that he thought that the West was the toughest region. I, I'm not sure that that's right simply because of you know, a ton of great names, but it just doesn't seem like they're the same players in those uniforms we've seen in the past. Still really good. I think Kansas has got an easier road than people think. And obviously the second round of the game they've got against the winner of Kentucky Villanova will be a test, but I don't think it's going to be that great of a test. I think Kansas is much better than both of those teams. The one team they would have to worry about more than anything would be Villanova because they've got Scotty Reynolds and they've got Curtis Sumter, two guys that will be very difficult matchup problems. But because of Kansas's depth, I like Kansas in that. I think the most interesting game when you look at it is Southern Illinois Holy Cross. I mean, Holy Cross very well coached by Ralph Willard. They can control tempo and you've got a team in Southern Illinois with Jamal Tatum, Matt Shaw. They're an outstanding defensive team. Randall Falker inside and they're an outstanding standing defensive team. They don't, score, they don't score it that easy, mm -hmm. and I think Holy Cross, if they can control tempo, has a chance to pull an upset there. I believe that, because when you look at their track record, Holy Cross has played very, very well in the NCAA tournament. Marquette, Kansas, Kentucky. They've only lost maybe those games in first round matchups by uh, six and a half points a game. But when you look at Keith Simmons, he can control the game because he's that good offensively. This is a very dangerous Holy Cross game. They played at Syracuse, they played at Duke, they played at Providence, but the thing is, when you look at what they're ready to do, listen to Ralph Willard, because he can flat out coach. He was at Pitt before he came to Holy Cross, and at Holy Cross, he's always had upset mindsets as his team plays in that first round. 
But when you look at how they've got to get it done, Southern Illinois, solid team, but more important is, can they be ready with the right mindset, Hubert, to get it done in their game? Well, they're going to have to have some mindset in that 8-9 matchup between Kentucky and Villanova. And Kentucky is a team uh, that has really struggled in the latter part of the season. They have a post-up guy, Randolph Morrison, that can manufacture points in the paint, but where they have struggled, they're a terrific defensive team, but knocking down perimeter jump shots. When you look at Bobby Perry, Joey Crawford, these guys are going to have to knock down that three-point shot, but look at Villanova. The reason why I think this team can go very far and really match up well against Kansas is because of Scotty Reynolds, the freshman point guard. He can knock down threes, he can penetrate into the lane, and he can finish. And Jay talked about Curtis Sumpter, a guy that has had a lot of injuries throughout his career. At 6'7", this is a guy that can get points in the paint. He can play at the high post. He can put the ball on the floor. He's very versatile, and this is a great first-round matchup between uh, Villanova and also Kentucky, Dick. You know, one of the reasons they do it, well, I'm sorry, they shoot free throws so well, 77%. Yeah. That's going to be really key for them. All right, let's uh, check in with Dick Vitale now. Dick, uh, what are your thoughts about, about that portion of the West bracket? Well, first of all, I happen to think it's the toughest region. I know some of my compadres don't agree with me, and I respect <laughs> their opinion. But I flat out think it's the toughest, just like I think it's unfair to talk about who Drexel has lost to. I mean, a lot of teams lost to people. You lose to Virginia Commonwealth, Old Dominion, and teams of that stature, they're pretty good teams. And I'm still boiling about the fact of Drexel getting a raw deal because maybe I like the little guy, and I've been there. But I will tell you this as well. Taking a look up here, that matchup when you look at Villanova, and Kentucky. I mean, there's a lot of heat down there in Kentucky. A lot of the fans upset. They might get a little bit even more upset when you see what happens here. Scotty Reynolds has been super. Curtis Sumter's been unbelievable when he's healthy. He can play with anybody. I think that's going to be a tough matchup, and I don't think it's as easy for Kansas as some people might think. I think that region's got some tough, tough basketball teams. They have a lot of tradition, a lot of history, and I think kids play with a lot of pride when they come to the tournament representing that history. This has been the year of the freshman in college basketball and not just Scotty Reynolds. But I tell you, Kentucky has a freshman in Jody Meeks that is starting to emerge as a scintillating star player for the Wildcats. It'll be a great matchup of freshmen between the Wildcats and the Wildcats in that 8-9 matchup with the winner likely to go on to face Kansas. Well, you know, one thing we've been able to count on over the last decade is that Duke would be a one seed or maybe a two seed. Not so much for the Blue Devils. Could it be that they would be one and done in the tournament? The journey begins on Selection Monday. From the tournament draw... I think they're a Final Four quality team. ...to the final buzzer. We'll take you there. NCAA Women's Basketball Selection Special, Monday at 8 on ESPN. Hey, guys. Printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. Donovan McNabb is driven, motivated, hungry. Hungry enough for Campbell's Chunky New England Clam Chowder. Feed your NFL-sized hunger. Campbell's Chunky, meals that fill you up right. No shame in soft skin. Old Spice Body Wash. There were two options. Change the road or change the SUV. Introducing the Acura MDX with super handling all-wheel drive. Technology takes it to a whole new place. Acura. Advance. Hey, hey, look at me. Lock in. Crusher here has an extra deltoid muscle. It means he's got exponentially greater bucking propulsion. Now you lean back and you hang on. I'll be there. You rodeo clowns are a lifesaver. Rodeo clown? <laughs> no, I, I'm with the birthday party. Hello, <laughs> Oh, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> 
stay smart, stay at a Holiday Inn Express. Welcome back to ESPNU Bracketology, presented by Staples. Despite the fact that UCLA had twice as many top 25 victories on the season as Kansas, the Bruins did not get the one seed, largely because they lost their last two games. UCLA instead will open play in Sacramento on Thursday against Weber State. They are the two seed in the West. Duke typically is a one or two seed. In fact, for only second time in the last 10 years, the Blue Devils not occupying one of the first two lines. Duke with its lowest seed since they were an eight in 1996. They will start against Virginia. Virginia Commonwealth. Uh, Dick Vitale, this, this run for Duke is a little bit testier than it's been the last few years. Well, you know, they're all going to be tough. As Jay said, you know, you look at a lot of these teams here, certainly with great reputations, 29 national championships, and obviously they don't have the personnel they had in the past. But I still think from top to bottom, it's a quality, quality region. However, when you take a look there, you look at Pittsburgh, the real gripe down of Pittsburgh has been the fact that they have not been able to advance at tournament time. I think right now, Duke and Pittsburgh will hook up in the second round. Duke will not have it easy with Anthony Grant's team because because they're a good, solid basketball team. But I think they'll have too much. I think the fact of the matter is that they will rise to the occasion here. And also getting back Henderson, I think that Duke beats Pittsburgh and that ultimately gets beat by UCLA. And UCLA prevails. I think UCLA, even though our number two seed, I don't know what you guys think, Digger and Jay and Hubert and Brees, but I think they get a break. They don't have to leave California. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the fact that they're a two seed in the West doesn't affect them at all. But look at the 7-10 matchup. Indiana playing a very dangerous Gonzaga team. Why? Gonzaga's played everybody. They trapped 16,000 miles going back early in the season, making it to New York for the preseason NIT, playing down in Atlanta, playing Texas on the road. The fact is, when you look at how good this team could be, Derek Ravio can play in the perimeter game with Jeremy Parga. I look at Indiana with D.J. White. If he doesn't show up and establish an inside game, this Gonzaga team has no fear of playing anybody. Mark Few knows now that as he's gotten that conference championship to get the bid automatic, they now know that they can advance against a team like Indiana. Here. When Indiana and Gonzaga meet each other, the faces are going to be familiar, although they'll probably have to adjust the game plans a bit since it's Kelvin Sampson's first year at Indiana. But these two teams met last season in the second round, a 10-point victory for Mark Few Zags, in which they didn't shoot it particularly well from three-point land, but, and that was with Adam Morrison and no Josh Heifelt this time around, and a new coach for Indiana. Now, I alluded to the Duke-Virginia Commonwealth game. Virginia Commonwealth has some components that might give the Devils some trouble. Yeah, let, let's look at Duke, and they're playing uh, VCU, which is the winner of the Colonial Athletic Conference. They've got an outstanding point guard in Eric Maynor. He took over that championship game against George Mason, getting steals, getting into the open court. He can really make great decisions, but when you look at Duke, they come in with a three-game losing streak. I think the key for them is Josh McRoberts. When you look at VCU, they don't have a lot of size, so Josh McRoberts must take advantage of his height, get down low, and get points in the paint. This will be a return of Gerald Henderson, who was suspended for one game. Greg Paulus has to do an outstanding job of taking care of the basketball. And When you look at Duke, but one of the things that they have really struggled with all year is guarding the ball and dribble penetration. When you look at VCU, they have a guard trio that can really penetrate and score from the perimeter. Yeah, and it's not just Maynard. You have B.A. Walker, Jesse Pellarosa, guys who are older. And I agree with you, though. I think the inside guys are going to be the difference. And Duke has to get back to guarding like they did a little bit earlier in the season. They haven't been as good defensively. But, you know, I think Pittsburgh has got an interesting route. They're going to have to, if, if Duke is able to get past Virginia Commonwealth, to have to play Pittsburgh in the second round is going to be a difficult grinded out game the key is going to be how duke shoots it against pittsburgh if pittsburgh survives a pretty game and solid right state team that was able to beat butler in their conference championship and indiana gonzaga i love that i think that is going to be a great game because indiana is much tougher defensively this year than they were last year they're a team that goes into games expecting a fight last year i don't think they did expect a fight this year i think they do they're much better guarding out on the perimeter they're much more solid inside with dj white now healthy and able to block shots. He's getting up and down the court a little bit better. Still not running as well as he used to, but UCLA, I still think the class of the bottom half of this draw. I think Pittsburgh's got some serious issues. Aaron Gray didn't even show up in that game against Georgetown. Going one for 13. Didn't take the challenge of Warhead, but they've been struggling all year. We saw them play at Marquette. Marquette beat them there, but the fact is when you look at Pitt, 
I don't know if their perimeter game's there. They've got a lot of inconsistency. Antonio Graves, when he gets going in and out, uh, Ronald Ramon, can he shoot the threes? It's been, it's been hit and miss. And this is going to be one of those games when they look at Wright State, don't take that game lightly because if you're looking ahead, Wright State's that type of team is going to give you a run for your money. Well, I agree with you, Coach, but the answer has to be Aaron Gray. He has to be confident and he has to be aggressive down low in the post. He's the difference maker. He's the guy that's going to open up all those uh, perimeter players like LeVance Fields. He has to be aggressive. He was 1 of 12 from the field in the championship game against Georgetown. If Pittsburgh wants to go anywhere, he has to be great. But you talk about inconsistent. This entire bracket, with the exception of Kansas, UCLA, Southern Illinois, this entire bracket has been inconsistent. So you don't know which <laughs> team is going to show up on any given night. I guess if you want to talk about inconsistency, we'd have an eight-team tournament. And the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the other 57 have been a little bit spotty here and there. We've seen all 65 teams down. The bracket has been completely unveiled. And the tournament selection committee, that they're going to take some shots as they do every year. Andy Cash joining us now with a few tidbits on some of these uh, moves and selections they made, Andy? That's right. I just got off the conference call with Gary Walters, the Princeton Athletic Director, the chair of the selection committee, and he's got some interesting answers to some of the questions that we've raised over the last hour. First of all, he said this was the toughest bracket that they've had to put together in his five years on the committee, saying there were 104 teams that had more than 20 wins, so certainly a lot more teams were on the bubble, so to speak. Now, he did mention the unbalanced schedule in these conferences was a major factor as for why Syracuse didn't get in, as to why Kansas State get, didn't get in, because they played in the weaker of the two divisions in terms of their conference schedule. But he also cited that's why, like a Stanford got in, going 10-8 and eight in a true round Robin. As for Drexel, the sort of wart on their resume was going 1-5 against the top teams in the CAA. Some other interesting tidbits were these. First of all, today's games had a major factor on the last berth. They were holding one spot. NC State wins, they get it, they lose, Arkansas got the bid. So they actually made the decision on Arkansas before that game went final. Once NC State lost, that bid was available for Arkansas. As for Kansas-Texas, that game, according to Walters, had no bearing on Kansas being a number one seed. They were already a number one seed. Texas, though, could have moved up a line had they won that game. UCLA, he said, lost their number one seed once they did not advance past the quarterfinals in the Pac-10 tournament. Reese? All right, Andy, one might wonder if they waited till the end of the Arkansas game if one of those other bubble teams might have made it into the field. <laughs> UCLA, they are the 2C. We're going to hear from Ben Howen in just a little while. He'll join us, the Bruins, trying to return to the Final Four for the second straight year and take it one step further. Last year when they were the national runner-up. Ben Howen coming up in a while. If these walls could talk, they'd tell you that in this game, Nothing is out of bounds. They tell you there's nowhere to hide. They tell that guy in 2G to stop spilling his drink on them. They'd wince, they'd cheer, they'd scream in terror, they'd ask to see a doctor. If these walls could talk, they'd say you have to see it to believe it. Russell Athletic, ESPN Arena Football, Los Angeles Avengers versus Orlando Predators, Monday at 7 p.m. on ESPN2. You know, having a hot wife, like mine, is, you know, it could be a drag. You know, guys are always, always checking her out. And now she wants to get a convertible. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know what she's going to get? A beige box with tinted windows. financial help are you looking for? Maybe you need insurance to help protect you. Benefits to help your business reach new heights. Or a retirement plan to invest for the future. Then again, maybe there's someone who can help with all of those things. The Principal Financial Group will give you an edge. If you thought Borat was outrageous in theaters, oh the baby! Wait until you see it on DVD. With 30 minutes of outrageous footage you didn't see in theaters. King in the castle, king in the castle. Get Borat on DVD today.
Well, being a number one seed is great, but you don't necessarily have to be to make it to the Final Four. Florida was a three seed and won its first national championship, making it to the Final Four. UCLA reached the title game for the first time since 1995, and the Bruins were a two seed before they made it to Indianapolis. LSU was a four seed. They knocked off the top seed in the South and the two seed Texas, knocking off Duke and Texas on their way. And then George Mason, the second 11 seed ever to make it to the Final Four as Jim Laranega's team had the Cinderella run to make it to the Final Four. Now, making it two years in a row, a very difficult proposition. See, the last four teams able to do that, Maryland, the last to do it in 2001 and 2002, and a guy who would love to be able to follow that path is Ben Howland of UCLA, and Ben is joining us now, courtesy of DirecTV's March Mega Madness. Now, Ben, the stat has come up that no team has ever won a national championship after losing the first game of its conference tournament. How do you use that for motivation? I don't concern myself. I mean, you have mathematicians figuring out what if or what's ever happened. Uh, you know, we're very excited about our year, Reese. We had a great regular season. That's over now. We were the regular season Pac-10 champs. Our league put six teams in the NCAA tournament out of ten teams. Uh, our team was ranked, I think, number one for six weeks in a row. We have the best uh, record against the top 25 in the RPI. Uh, we're number two in the RPI, so we're confident in ourselves and uh, looking forward to the opportunity to get out and play some more basketball, starting with Weber State, which is exciting for me, being that it's my alma mater. Do they take it easy on you? Are you going to dry up all of the alumni contribution checks? You know, it's, it's <laughs> funny. They, they've had a great year here uh, at Weber State. Uh, you know, Randy Ray has done an outstanding job. Uh, I'm, I'm proud that I uh, went to school there and played for Neil McCarthy. Uh, but obviously, I'm all about UCLA now, so we're going to come up to Sacramento uh, prepared to play, and we need to uh, come on off a disappointing loss in the first round of the conference tournament. Hey, Dick Ben, Vitale. I want to ask you this, Ben, Dick Vitale. I want to simply ask you, buddy, what would you rather be? Number one seed, be shipped out to the east, or number two, play right out there in the west? Well, you know the answer to that, Dick, and uh, we're excited <laughs> to be in the west. Uh, there's no question that uh, when we went into the year, uh, I talked with our team about the fact that, you know, if we were going to have a chance to, to get back to where we want to be, where every team wants to be, it was to go through Sacramento and through San Jose. Uh, and, you know, that's the best for our fans, for obviously the, the players' families to be in California. And, uh, you know, we've got our work cut out for us, there's no question about it. And the great thing about this tournament is anybody can beat anybody on a given night. That's why there's so much interest and there's, there's uh, you know, so many people excited out there about the potential upsets and the opportunities uh, for the 5-12. And the one thing that's never happened is a 16-1 upset and almost happened last year with Albany and UConn. So anything's possible. I understand that and we have to be ready to play or Weber State will have us as a victim. Ben, what is the difference in the way your team played in its last two games as opposed to the way it was playing before that? Well, 10 days ago, we clinched the Pac-10 championship and swept Washington State, a three-seed in the tournament. Uh, and then we went into Washington, which is 17-2 and two at home on the year, and they played us very, very tough. You have to give Washington credit. They beat us there, fair and square. Uh, you know, I don't know if we had quite the edge that we needed to have since we clinched it. We won our league by two games against teams. That, you know, Oregon's a three-seed, SC's a five-seed, Washington State's a three-seed. Uh, obviously, Stanford got in, which I was pleased with. They're an 11 seed. Arizona's going to be a tough out as an 8 seed. So this arguably is the best conference in the country. And, uh, you know, our loss to Washington. And then Cal. Cal played great against us. We turned the ball over too many times in the first half. And, again, had a four-point lead and had a two-point lead with 13 seconds to go against a team that uh, is a tough team. Uh, you, uh, uh, their Yabaka, their, their point guard, had a great game, 29 points. And, we have to bounce back now, and we had a good practice yesterday, and I, so I feel good. We came back, and actually we were able to work on things in practice that we haven't done since October 15th. We got back to the basics yesterday, and I think it's going to help our team. Ben Howen, the head coach at UCLA. Ben, thanks for the time, and best of luck in the tournament. Okay, thank you. All right, Ben Howen. A lot of subplots going on there. UCLA, a potential second-round game against Gonzaga, a team that had the emotional loss to the Bruins in the Sweet 16 last year, and maybe UCLA makes it to the Sweet 16. Howen could face his old school, his former employer, 
the Pittsburgh Panthers. All kinds of intrigue and subplots, but a lot of ball to be played before we get there. So which region is the toughest? Who has the toughest path to make it to the Final Four? Visit Georgetown. Georgetown coming out of the east. Maybe the bottom half opens up, but what about the top half? We'll discuss the toughest region when we come back. Band sassing up the neighborhood in your shiny convertible. Let me tell you, people need convertibles like I need a belly shirt. They recruited him to take down an assassin. There's going to be an attempt on the life of the president. We need you to stop it. But he was the one being set up. They're never going to stop chasing you. I got a plan. Kill him. Started, but I mean to see it through. Exercise our right to bear arms. Shooter. Looks like you're all set for pretty much anything. I couldn't agree more. Rated R. Don't start it March 23rd. I'm not gonna throw my hard earned money away. I'm gonna put it in like a bond or savings account. Not tied up into some crazy convertible. Shoot. You know why they make the roofs go down, don't you? To make it easier for you to throw your money out of them. I can't believe I didn't get that promotion. What's wrong with me? You've got sports video deficiency, Robbie. Kenny Maine? You crying? No. You need ESPN 360. It's the game and everything around it, including real-time stats, in-depth historical analysis, and more. And it's all at your control. Together, we can fight sports video deficiency. And watch Championship Week live. <laughs> Log on now. Don't you worry about a thing. For the next half hour, I got your back. Stephen Colbert, finally, a TV journalist speaking out for the little guy. Get ready to make a difference by watching TV. The Colbert Report, weeknights at 11.30 after The Daily Show, only on Comedy Central. Arby's due for $4 fish sandwiches. A tender fish filet with tartar sauce, lettuce, and tomato on a sesame seed bun. It's a deal that'll have you saying, I'm thinking Arby's. Your Northern Ohio Chrysler and Jeep dealers are lighting up the auto show with great lease rates and low APRs on America's hottest products, like the all-new four-door Jeep Wrangler, Jeep Compass with Electronic Stability Program, the five-star front crash test rated Chrysler Aspen, and the Sebring Sedan. And now through March 12th, get $500 auto show bonus cash on Jeep Liberty or Chrysler Town & Country with stow-and-go seating and storage. But hurry, you only have until March 12th to get $500 auto show bonus. See your Northern Ohio Chrysler and Jeep dealer today. Well, it was anything but a house party a year ago for the number one seed. UConn was the number one seed, lost to George Mason in the Elite Eight and failed to make it to the Final Four. Fellow Big East member Villanova fell to eventual national champion Florida, also in the Elite Eight. Villanova, the second number one seed to go down a year ago. Memphis did likewise in the Elite Eight, falling to UCLA, who made it to the national championship game against Florida. And Duke stepped short of the Elite Eight. They lost to Big Baby, Tyrus Thomas, and LSU and the stifling defense of Garrett Temple. The Bayou Bengals won in the Sweet 16 on their way to the Final Four. So these, the top four seeds in each region, obviously by videotaped evidence, the number one seed really doesn't mean anything as far as a guarantee of going to the Final Four. But since seeding started in 1979, 20 of the 28 champions have been seeded, either number one or number two in their region. That would seem to bode well for some of the top two seeds, either North Carolina, Georgetown, Kansas, UCLA, Florida, Wisconsin, Ohio State, or Memphis. So now the debate begins. Who really has the toughest road? Which region is the toughest? Doug, what do you think? I think it's the South, and I, I really don't not sure it's that close. I mean, look at Nevada. They're ranked 13th in the country, and they're a seven seed. We all think Nick Fazekas is a great player. They're going to take on Creighton, who not only won 13 games in the Missouri Valley, but then went on and won their tournament. And you look at Memphis, a team that's won 22 consecutive games. Granted, they've been in the Witness Protection Program, also known as Conference USA. And the best three seed of the boat, to me, is Texas A&M. And oh yeah, by the way, if they get to the regionals, they're going to be playing essentially a home game in San Antonio. And by the way, they'll have to go through Louisville in Lexington if, Le if Louisville survives 
uh, Stanford. And remember, Louisville had won seven in a row before losing in the Big East tournament. You look at all these hot teams. Hubert, I think the South is the toughest, especially the bottom part of that South bracket. Uh, you know, Doug, I, I'm going to have to disagree with you. When you look at the East region from top to bottom, it has to be the toughest region. Uh, they have three teams, in my opinion, that have an opportunity, not have an opportunity. If they won the national championship, you wouldn't be surprised. When you look at North Carolina, you look at Texas and Georgetown. Georgetown, one of the hottest teams in the country. They have won 14 out of the last 15 games. They just won the Big East tournament. North Carolina, in my opinion, the deepest team in the country. They're young and experienced. They just won the ACC tournament uh, uh, championship. And then you look at Texas. I mean, we've been watching Texas all year. A young, inexperienced team as well. But Kevin Durant, clearly the best player in the country from an offensive standpoint. He doesn't have a weakness, but he has help. DJ Augustine, AJ Abram. Augustine, as a freshman, led the Big 12 in assists. So when you look at this bracket, what other bracket has three teams that at the end of the day can win a national championship? But it's not just those four seeded teams. When you look at what? The number one seeds the last five years only of the 20 number one seeds, only six have gotten to the final four. So if we look at that East, which I think is the toughest, go back even before the Sweet 16 games. In the second round, you get a Marquette, a Southern Cal, a Vanderbilt, a Boston College. And those are the teams that really can play. And, and when you look at how you get things done, if you're not ready to play, things can pop up and get it done. But I look at the East as the toughest, but I think the West, for UCLA to play at home, to know what this team has done. They were in a championship game last year. Ben Holland knows their defense is better. Darian Collison is better. This team with Josh Shipp and Aaron Ofello, this is the team that I feel has the easiest way to get back to the Final Four in Atlanta, Dick. Well, you know, Digger, I think we can look at all these regions, and it's a matter of taste. I mean, do you like a Giselle Bunchen? Do you like an Eva Longoria? Do you like a Jessica Beal? I mean, it's a matter of taste. I mean, all of these really there, have. Dick. What's that? <laughs> I said there are no losers out of the ones you've just mentioned, right? They're all winners, man. You can throw in Tyra Banks, too. But I'll tell you this. Well, I'm so ugly, I have no shot with any of them. But let me tell you this. I look, I look at all those regions. They all have some positives, some negatives. Bottom line, guys, any way we cut it, you got to win six in a row. you got to be a quality basketball team. you got to defend. you got to make the three. And you better have a star player to make big plays late in the game. We saw Florida last year dominate. Did a terrific job defensively. Noah took his game to another level. Level. You simply got to win six in a row. Get hot, get the right matchup, perform, and you march on. It doesn't matter what I think, you think, or anybody thinks as to what's the toughest region. All that is is talk, radio talk. And as I said, guys, it's a matter of taste. Did you like Willie Mays? Like Mickey Mantle? Who did you like? Duke Snyder? I love Willie Mays, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all hot after that model analogy. <laughs> not, sure exactly where to, not sure exactly where to go after that. But, you know, I, it, my, for my taste, I think the East is the toughest region. Having North Carolina, Georgetown, which I think is the hot hottest number two seed uh, that's in the NCAA tournament. They're so physical at the guard position. They shoot the ball very well. If you play a man, they're going to cut you to death. It's just a very difficult team to play against. Washington State, not one of the tougher threes, but they play a different style that can be hard to play against. And Texas, by far the toughest four. They're as good as most of the twos on a given day. And they've got a player in Kevin Durant that can carry a team all the way to the final four and beyond. He is Carmelo Anthony Good. After that, I would go to the Midwest. I think the Midwest West is the second toughest region because you got Florida, Wisconsin, who could have been a one seed had they been able to avoid Ohio State a little bit more often. Oregon may be the most dangerous of the threes. And Maryland, who is a really dangerous team because they've got inside play to go with their outside play. And they've got a senior in DJ Strawberry. They've got a great shooter in Mike Jones. But you've got Arizona, by far the most dangerous eight. You've got Notre Dame, a team that can really score as a six seed and a dangerous team. And in the Midwest, Georgia Tech is a 10. I mean, Georgia Tech is awfully good for a 10. And I, that's why I think the Midwest and the East are the two toughest regions. I think Dick Vitale's right. There's no easy way to the Final Four or easy way to win a national championship. And if you're looking for teams in your bracket that are national championship good, if you've got to win six games in a row, look on their schedule. See if they won six in a row during the regular season. Because <laughs> if they didn't, you know, they're probably not going to win at all. Hey, I want to go back to something Doug said, too. He's talked a little bit about Louisville having the home advantage being in the state of Kentucky. Got to remember, those basketball-mad Wildcat fans have already snapped up all those tickets. 
they'll go in there and start rooting against Louisville. <laughs> you think anybody's going to cheer for Rick Pitino and Rupp Arena to get Louisville to advance around past Stanford? But they're just happy to be there. Stanford's happy to be there. Others a little bit upset that they're not in the field of 65. Syracuse is one of those. We're going to hear from Jim Beheim in just a little bit and also hear from Gary Walters, who is the chairman of the Tournament Selection Committee. We'll hear what Beheim has to say about the snub of the orange when we come back. Which is why we use the turn signal. All right, who can tell Mr. Leffler why it's dangerous to go fast? The, the faster you go, the less control you have over your car. Very good, Mr. Edwards, which is why... Well, yeah, because last year at Charlotte, going about 175 off turn four, Casey got real sideways and just T-boned me right in the door. If I had backed it down to, say, 150, 140, he'd have missed me completely. T-boned you. Well done. The NASCAR Bush Series at Atlanta. Coverage begins Saturday at 2.30 Eastern on ABC. Hey, guys. Printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. What do you got? This watch can teleport you anywhere in the world. Not bad. Not bad? You can read a person's mind. This pen turns into a helicopter. What's this? Fuel injection, reverse gear, aluminum frame. The all-new Kawasaki KFX 450R, declassified, March 2007. Fellas, welcome to our camp. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Just work together with me. Knock it away from me. Use the board. If you could go to a camp with Coach K, bring it in again. For the same price as one with Coach J. Chase it. Work it. Why wouldn't you? Right. It's the same with car insurance. If you could get the personal service of a State Farm agent for the same or less than those other guys, why wouldn't you? Nobody can match our combination of service and low rates. Get a quote today. Give me the ball. Ooh. I mean, why would you ask me out? Clearly, this is the package that you were drawn to. And then, what? Let's put the top down? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> because I have a lot invested here. I know that this looks effortless. I'm Fred Hickman here with this Sports Center 30 at 30 update. Well, what happens in Vegas has happened for the third consecutive time. Jimmy Johnson winning the Daimler Chrysler UAW 400 ahead of his teammate, uh, uh, Jeff Gordon. And a uh, force in the NHL, Islanders left wing Chris Simon has been suspended for a league record 25 games, including the playoffs, after clotheslining Ryan Holway with a stick last Thursday. Next Sports Center after Mavs Lakers 24 7 sports on ESPN News. All right, Fred, thanks a lot. You know, six straight years, we've had at least one 12 seed beat a five guys. In fact, back in 2002, three of the 12 seeds were able to knock off fives. Happened a couple of times last year as well. The other team, uh, Syracuse, was seeded fifth. They took on Texas A&M. AC Law and the guys under Billy Gillespie getting their feet wet in tournament play and perhaps the Q's a little gassed after making that run through the Big East tournament. They played their way up to a five and then Joseph Jones and the fellas bounced them quickly. Nevada was a five seed. They went down at the hands of Montana last year. So 12-5 upsets, certainly not uncommon. In fact, they've come to be expected. The trick is you're starting to fill out those brackets, which you can do on ESPN.com is to figure out which of the five will be vulnerable to the 12. These are the 5-12 matchups this year. Butler and Old Dominion, a couple of mid-majors. Virginia Tech and Illinois slipped into the field. Two teams from high major conferences have slipped in. Illinois and Arkansas. The Razorbacks get the Trojans. Hope they have better luck in basketball than they've had in football the last couple of years. A couple of blowouts at the hands of SC on the gridiron. And then in the south, Tennessee and Long Beach State 5-12 matchup. So as you kick these around, guys, which one, Jay, do you see? Which five seeds are most vulnerable? Well, I think Southern Cal playing against Arkansas. If Charles Thomas is healthy, I think that's a game that Arkansas can and arguably should win. Now, I think Southern Cal's got the better guards. They're all breakdown guards. Guys like Nick Young can get to the basket. Gabe Pruitt, the same way. They got a, a freshman point guard in Daniel Hackett, and I think that might put them a little bit at risk in that 5-12 game. The other game, I think, is, is Illinois over Virginia Tech. I think Illinois, because they can guard people and because they have size with Sean Pruitt inside, they've got Warren Carter that can step away. He's long-armed. He can block shots, and Brian Randall can guard just about anybody. Yeah, I think Illinois would have a very good shot against Virginia Tech. 
I look at Old Dominion. I think Butler really has been struggling lately. You know, they had a lot of pressure to win the preseason NIT. Michael Smith, as well as AJ, I mean, Michael Green, as well as AJ Graves. But you look at Old Dominion, Drew Williamson, this team's good. They won at Georgetown. I think they're going to have a lot of confidence going to this game because Butler's going to think, okay, it's Old Dominion, a team everybody said, well, maybe they should or shouldn't be in. Yeah, I, I agree with Jay when you're looking at Southern California and also Arkansas. Arkansas, uh, there's been much debate whether should, they should be in the tournament or not. But one of the things that Arkansas does has as tremendous size. Stephen Hill, Charles Thomas, he had 18 points and eight, 18 rebounds in the semifinal match in the SEC tournament. So this is a team, when you look at USC, they have tremendous versatility, but they do not have size. They could take advantage of that in that game. And Long Beach State's got a shot against Tennessee because they get up and down the floor. They shoot a lot of threes. Aaron Nixon was the player of the year in that league. And, you know, I think one of the things they're going to have to deal with is Tennessee, when they guard inbounds plays, they'll put their five man on it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to turn it over a few times against that. But Long Beach State's dangerous. If they start knocking shots down early, you let them stay in the game, they can beat you. All right. Couple of the 12 seeds debatable about whether they should be in Arkansas and Illinois. You'll be able to hear what the selection committee was thinking when they made some of the choices, when they decided to leave Syracuse out. Gary Walters, who is the chairman of the Tournament Selection Committee and the Athletic Director at Princeton, will join us when Bracketology continues. Hey guys, printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with an empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples, that was easy. It's a beautiful day inside. Temperature about 71 degrees with the air conditioning. Number one player in the world making his way to the tee box. Looks like Tiger's got a turkey avocado sandwich. I make them all the time, Jim. Wow. Look at the gallery. You can sense the electricity. Tiger Woods, PGA Tour 07. Good evening for everyone. EA Sports, it's in the game. How do you measure wealth? Sorry, Mr. Cross. I know Mr. Cross is not available right now. He's in a meeting. No time. Does the answer lie solely in how much money you have? Hello? Maybe wealth can be measured in two ways. Financially, and how we live our lives as human beings. American Century Investments. Now at Pizza Hut, buy a large Cheesy Binds pizza for just $11.99 and get a free LG chocolate phone with a new two-year activation on a Verizon wireless plan of $39.99 or more. A free phone from the pizza that gives you more. Can I hold it? No. Want more? Get America's favorite pizza, Pizza Hut. If these walls could talk, they'd tell you that in this game, nothing is out of bounds. They'd tell you there's nowhere to hide. They'd tell that guy in 2G to stop spilling his drink on them. They'd wince, they'd cheer, they'd scream in terror, and they'd ask to see a doctor. If these walls could talk, they'd say you have to see it to believe it. Russell Athletic, ESPN Arena Football, Los Angeles Avengers versus Orlando Predators, Monday at 7 p.m. on ESPN2. Back on Bracketology, these teams saw their bubbles burst on Selection Sunday, all with very good records. Be able to parse the numbers any way you want. As they say, if you torture the numbers long enough to make them confess to anything, but many of these teams have very good cases to why they should be in the field of 65. And joining us now is the chair of the Tournament Selection Committee for the NCAA, Gary Walters. Gary, you hear people say that the committee is trying to send a message, whether it be about scheduling, non-conference play, playing road games, whatever it is. What message was this committee trying to send? Uh, gee, I don't know, Reese, that we're trying to send any messages. Our, our task uh, is to uh, select the 34 best at large uh, teams uh, in the eyes of the uh, 10 committee members and uh, to do so in, in the fairest, most equi equitable way we possibly uh, can. And uh, in addition to that, our task is to try to create a national bracket uh, that's extraordinarily balanced, where we basically are conducting four national championships at the same time leading up to the final four. So uh, our job isn't to send messages. Our job is to try to select what we think are the 34 most worthy teams. So what made Arkansas worthy of getting in ahead of, say, teams like Florida State or Syracuse, in your estimation? Well, you know, it, it's a close call. And um, 
you know, one of the uh, issues related to those three teams, because obviously they almost look somewhat like uh, clones of each other, which is one of the real challenges that we face more generally this year. As I had uh, mentioned uh, in, some pre in some previous interviews, uh, this year became even more complicated by the fact that 104 teams had uh, over uh, 20 victories versus uh, uh, 78 in the past, which was the previous high. So we had more teams to compare and contrast. You know, as it, so I, I would be reluctant to just compare Florida, Arkansas, and Syracuse because that, ne you know, that neglects you know, four or five or six other teams uh, that we were also uh, considering. Uh, but uh, suffice so, so to say our, that we think that... Uh, I'm sorry, Gary, what gave Arkansas uh, the edge then over, over the entire group? I, I, think the, I think the one thing that we were impressed with with uh, Arkansas is the fact that, you know, they went pretty deep in their tournament. They got to the final game. Uh, one of the things that we had said uh, was that we're going to look at the full body of work because of the parity. Um, you know, we're going to uh, really drill down and dissect, and there might be li certain little tipping points, uh, you know, that uh, would result in one team getting in versus another team getting in. However, I don't want anybody to uh, misunderstand that as being categorical. You know, uh, performance in, in conference tournaments is one issue. Performance on the road is another issue. Who you play is another issue. Uh, you know, uh, how you've performed in conference is another issue. So. I mean, we're, we're really looking at a multitude of variables. Uh, everybody is looking at them from the standpoint of their own perspective, and then we're making consensus, deci consensus decisions. <coughs> Gary, Gary, obviously it's very tough. Whatever you come down, you've been there five years, you come down to the last two or three selections, you're always going to have people like us moaning and groaning. But you look at right. Arkansas, they're in, they're in a West Division, Gary. They're mediocre at best. They're seven and nine. How do they get the edge, for example? You look at a team like Drexel, for example. They don't get many people to give them a chance to play on the road. They get an opportunity to go to Syracuse. They win. They get an opportunity to go to Villanova. They win. They get an opportunity to go to Creighton. They win. And I know, and Jay pointed it out, and he pointed out the facts are right there. They were one in five with some of the upper echelon clubs, and I know that stands out as a red flag. But when you look at their total resume, why isn't their resume more impressive than Arkansas, who's two and eight when they go on a the road? They have Texas Tech and Arkansas, they get beat. I don't understand the logic of denying the little guy who's chasing that dream. I mean, really, uh, that really bothers me. It really does, Gary. Well, Dick, one of the things that I would say in, in response to your question is, and, and I think this is one of the great things about the tournament, uh, and I've uh, used uh, some, uh, you know, uh, some, some terminology that I'll, I'll, I'll try to spare as it relates to Jacksonian and Jeffersonian democracy, uh, but one of the things that we have is the balance between AQs and at-larges, and so um, to a certain extent, you know, our job when we're trying to choose the 34 best at large teams, that's exactly what we're trying to do. I respect the fact uh, that Drexel played a very, very strong record. Uh, the, uh, the fact, or, or a very, very strong non conference uh, uh, record. Uh, the fact of the matter is, however, that we, we also looked at the overall balance of their performance uh, within the league uh, that caused uh, some pause. And, um, and so uh, ultimately, you know, one of the teams that we did select, Old DU, had a balance of really good performance both inside the league and outside the league. And uh, when we looked at, at Old ODU against some of the other teams that we were comparing and contrasting them against, uh, we felt that they merited inclusion. Uh, again, uh, I would also say that it would be the height of arrogance for me to say, uh, as it would, f I think, for any committee to say, that uh, we also get everything 100% right all the time. Uh, I'm not suggesting that not selecting Drexel uh, isn't uh, the right decision. I am suggesting that if you put 10 different people around a table, one can, can come up with different results. And perhaps if uh, someone from the Big East might argue that Syracuse is one of those teams that should have been included, and joining us right now on the phone is Jim Beheim, the head coach of the Orange. Jim, what was your reaction when you found out that your team did not make the field of 65? Well, total shock because, uh, you know, I don't pay a lot of attention to the pundits, but every single one of them had us in the tournament. So if a couple of them had been saying we weren't in, I guess I wouldn't have been as shocked. 
We finished ahead of both Villanova and Marquette in our league. We had the fourth toughest conference schedule. We beat Villanova and split with them, and we beat Marquette at Marquette. So when you're playing a league and you finish 10-6 and six ahead of people that get selected, that's very difficult. I'm not talking about Arkansas, whether they were 7-9 and nine or not. 10-6 uh, and six in the Big East has always gotten teams in. I believe it should have gotten us in. We played a tough non-conference schedule. We played Wichita State and Drexel and, uh, you know, uh, Oklahoma State. When we played Oklahoma State, they were on their way to 15-1. and one. Uh, You know, it's not really our fault that they didn't play well at the end of the year. But uh, it was very disappointing. Uh, we had a winning road record, which none of those teams the last four or five uh, seeds uh, have. And uh, we had a 500 road record in our conference. And we finished six and two in our last eight games, seven and three in our last ten. So by the criteria that I know of, we should have been in the tournament. All right, Gary. Uh, this brings up one point that I think is a fair one. Uh, let's have a quick answer, if you can. Here, you mentioned that Drexel and its performance in conference was what hurt them, despite their good non-conference. Now Syracuse does that; they perform well in their conference, yet they're left out. How do you how do you justify those two sides and those two positions? Well, I, I, I think that once again, people want to set up these uh, decisions as being somewhat categoric, categorical, and what people do is they tend to raise. Um, uh, disguise uh, uh, self-interest in the name of certain principles. We're actually looking at a broad array of principles and comparing and contrasting teams uh, throughout uh, throughout the country. And where what happens as it relates to this is where you stand on the issues is in large part determined by where you sit, okay. whether that be within within your own conference, within your own ge uh, geography. Uh, whatever uh, institution you represent. How, Gary, how would you respond to those who say that teams from high major conferences are not evaluated the same way, that they have a sterner evaluation than mid-majors do? Well, boy, I, I'll tell you, uh, that's, that's really interesting because uh, one of the things that the committee, uh, I actually am feeling pretty good right now because one of the things the committee is being criticized for is not having more at-large teams from mid-major conferences. So if we're being criticized for not having enough teams and, and being critical, uh, too hypercritical as it relates to teams from major conferences, and we're also being critical, uh, being criticized for not having enough teams from uh, the, the so-called mid-major conferences, I think we probably hit the sweet spot. Gary Walters, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Gary Walters, he's the chairman of the Men's Tournament Selection Committee. And Gary Walters joining us. I'm not sure that uh, everybody's totally satisfied with all of the answers. Jim Bayheim also joining us. Jimmy, thanks for stepping in on a disappointing day for Syracuse. Florida hoping to go back to back and become the first team since Duke to repeat. As in, no, Stan, we are not getting a convertible. What are you going to want next, huh? An amp? <laughs> that is rich. If you thought Borat was outrageous in theaters, Oh, the baby! Wait until you see it on DVD. With 30 minutes of outrageous footage you didn't see in theaters. King in the castle, king in the castle. Get Borat. Pat O'Brien Chevrolet, home of the upfront guarantee. That means you'll find the absolute lowest sale price in the window of every car and truck, new or used, guaranteed. You don't have to negotiate to get it. And it's the same price for everybody, like shopping at a discount store. You're out the door. Can buying a car really be that simple? Yes, it can be, if you shop at Pat O'Brien Chevrolet. East in Willoughby Hills, west in Westlake. Start something new with Time Warner Cable. Sign up for digital cable with DVR service and take charge of your TV. Get over 200 channels of programming with up to 45 channels of commercial-free CD-quality music. And with an optional digital video recorder, catch all your favorite shows. Record an episode or entire season to watch anytime you want. Plus, pause or rewind live TV with the touch of a button. So start something new. Call Time Warner Cable today and make the choice that's right for you. Discover digital cable with DVR service from Time Warner Cable. And discover the power of you.
Conference breakdown, always conference bragging rights when you get to the NCAA tournament. The ACC leading the way with seven bids. Hubert, anything surprise you here? Uh, it surprised me with the Big Ten getting six teams in. I thought they were going to get four teams, possibly five, and I keep talking about that matchup. Comparison of Purdue and Illinois, I can't believe both of those teams got in. What I find interesting, the six majors, the ACC, Big East, Big Ten, Pac-10, SEC, Big 12, they end up with 28 of the 34 at larges and what happened last year they ended up with 26 of the at larges so the mid majors did get two less this year when you take a look at a total of 34 at larges and, and much less than they'd be getting in years past because last year they, they got fewer than years before even though we were talking about boy the mid majors really got the benefit of the doubt here but I, you know I don't have any argument with the conferences I have argument with a few teams here I thought Florida State should have gotten in over Xavier or you can argue that Drexel should have gotten in or Syracuse I thought Syracuse was the one that should have been in perhaps at the top of the list. The formula has always been for the teams in the high major conferences, if you can win 10 in your league and win 20, you're going to get in. Didn't happen for Kansas State. Bob Huggins joining us on the phone. And Bob, you said yesterday that you were surprised that anybody was even talking about the possibility of your team not making it. What was the reaction when you saw you didn't make the field? Well, honestly, when the first couple brackets came out, I knew we weren't going to be in. So why do you think that is? Why, why do you think that they didn't put you guys in? What was the criteria that you believe they thought you fell short in? Well, I guess the, the thing to do is get a better draw in your conference tournament. Um, you know, Ole Miss was 8-8 eight and eight in that division. Arkansas was 7-9. and nine. Ole Miss is 20-11. and 11. Arkansas is 21-13. and 13. Arkansas lost to Missouri by 24, Texas Tech by 15, and Texas by 4. We happen to beat all three of those teams. But I feel I feel bad for somebody like Ole Miss that just got a bad draw in the tournament. If they had played Florida in a championship game, then maybe Ole Miss gets in. How much emphasis do you think uh, should be placed on conference tournaments? After all, you took it to Texas Tech pretty good, and, and they made the field, and you didn't. Reese, I don't know. You know, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, and I don't have I don't have any idea. They have a hard job. And I think everybody recognizes they have a hard job. And I think any time you're, you know, one of the last whatever, I don't know what we were, last few out, then I think, you know, you you maybe take a look at, at, at some of the other things. But, you know, the reality is we should have won more games. And if we'd have won more games, we wouldn't have had to worry about any of this. All right, Bob Huggins won a lot of games. Terrific first year at Kansas State. Thanks for taking some time be with us. Guys, there, there are plenty of candidates for the biggest snub. Jay, right now, who is the biggest snub in your, we'll see. All right, here is the Siemens Trophy right here. Who do you think the biggest snub is, Jay? I, I still think it's Syracuse. And it's not just that they won a certain number of games in their conference. It's that they, they did well on the road. You know, they beat teams like Georgetown. They won at Marquette. They beat Villanova. They played a quality schedule. And all this stuff about historically, they don't leave the state of New York. That, that's all baloney. They, they do play a good schedule and have played one. They played one this year. But, you know, I thought Syracuse should have been in the first of the line. Yeah, I agree with you about Syracuse, but I also think K-State. I, I really think Bob Huggins presented the case very, very well. And, and you look at the Big 12 and, and the strength of that conference, when you win 10 games like Bayheim did in the Big East, that has got to be stronger than some of the other cases that the, of the teams that did get in like in Arkansas. I have to agree with Jay in terms about Syracuse. I mean, this is a team that was 10-6 and six in conference, three top 25 wins. I thought they solidified it when they beat uh, Providence on the road, then they beat uh, Georgetown, Georgetown later in the, later in the week. Uh, that was a terrific win. Georgetown, that's the only loss they've had yes. in over a month. So uh, for Syracuse being out of the tournament is a major surprise for me. You know what I think is interesting? I mean, you know, we can sit here and talk about the transitive property of equality and I beat A, B, B, and B beat C, therefore A is better than C and all that stuff. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> What I want to hear is, do you think they're one of the 34 best teams? And, you know, when you listen to Gary Walters, he's very eloquent, and he makes a great case and answers questions very well. But he never said, we put them in because they're one of the 34 best teams, and that's, that's the way we felt. That's what I want to hear him say. We think they're one of the 34 best teams. Because I won't argue with you. If you've studied all this and you think this team is one of the 34 best, I'm probably not going to argue with you very much. If we start getting into this resume business about, well, this, this team beat that team and all that stuff, you know, then we got to go to the paper. And some of the paper doesn't make sense on some of these teams. Mm -hmm. But if you say they're 34 best, that's pretty. That, that's a good. That's answer. why they need some guys like Sam Newton on that committee. I think having coaches on that committee who've 
been through all this is another factor and criteria for the committee. But no, they, 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 they do did have a pretty good job. We're have, talking about uh, a few But talking Gary, about Gary Walters is yeah. the coach and Stan Morrison yeah, is the coach. They got smart basketball people. I'm talking about some of the other guys. Well, we're just a few minutes away from some basketball, just about eight minutes or so from getting things started. Dirk Nowitzki and the Mavericks going to take on the Lakers. That's coming up. A little NBA on ESPN. We'll make some picks when we come back. Hey, guys. Printer's out of ink. Just shake it. Out of ink? Get $3 off your total purchase with any empty ink cartridge from these brands. Staples. That was easy. I'm looking for my perfect match. I'm then sharing lots of pictures, quiet times. Must be virus-free. Got anything like that? Sure. Take a look at this notebook down here. With over 60,000 Windows Vista trained employees, Best Buy will match you up with a PC you'll love. This gateway is perfect for what you want to do. And Geek Squad can personalize it for you. Now when you buy a new PC, get this great offer from Geek Squad. It's time to love your PC. Come find your match at Best Buy. I waited too long to try an Old Spice Man. Dumb. The Old Spice Man performs best, and he lasts longer than the other guy. Take the Old Spice Challenge. I did. So I think the meeting went really well. Great job, Abby. I wish some of our managers worked as hard as you do. Well, I guess you'll just have to promote me to manager then, huh? Oh, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> I, I, uh, I understand that I have to work my way up, though. Switch to the network with the fewest dropped calls. Now get an ultra-thin Samsung phone for only $19.99. Singular is now the new AT&T. Your world delivered. ESPNU Bracketology is presented by Staples. That was easy. And in part by Best Buy. It's time to love your PC. Come find your match at Best Buy. Got a little peek at that baby a few minutes ago. The Siemens Trophy. It goes to the survivor and the national champion at the end of the season. So they've been voting on ESPN.com, telling us who they think going to win their first round games. Let's figure out who is going to advance according to Doug Gottlieb in the NCAA tournament. Doug, what do you have? Well, I love Florida coming out of their bracket. They're the number one seed overall. And I think Florida's going to match up with UNLV. Wisconsin hasn't looked as good since Brian Butch has been hurt. I like the matchup. Remember, Wendell White had a broken jaw. He's got the wiring off. UNLV, my surprise team. Kansas, UCLA. UCLA virtual walk. I think that's an easy bracket playing in, in California. Of course, I like Carolina and the Ohio State University. And then I like Florida advancing past UCLA just like last year in the national championship game. Ohio State has the look of a national championship caliber team. But I like the Gators reigning supreme in Atlanta. Well, I'm going to go back and look at the same scenario when I look at Florida and what, what goes on in their bracket with Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin will show up. I think they're not good a team, but I think Florida's a team to move on out of there. I like UCLA and Kansas. Kansas knows what they're up against playing UCLA out in California. UCLA, to me, is the stronger of the team. Georgetown, I believe that they are on a mission. I was impressed with them in the Big East Conference tournament. Carolina, I'm worried about Tyler Hansborough and what he is doing and what he isn't doing, especially with the way he has not been performing to his uh, best with that mask. He's got to get rid of that mask. And then, of course, when I look at the other bracket, I like Florida, Georgetown. I like Ohio State. And yet, for the championship game, I've got Florida playing against Georgetown, and I really think Georgetown can win this thing. Well... Well, well, I like I love Florida as well as a number one seed. Uh, they'll be playing Maryland probably in the Elite Eight. I mean, this is a team that has uh, played extremely well prior to the ACC tournament. And then you have uh, Kansas and UCLA. I really like uh, the way UCLA and I like Kansas coming out of there playing against uh, against Florida. North, North Carolina, uh, this is the toughest region in the East region, but I think they come out of here playing against a Texas A&M team with AC Law. I like Florida and North Carolina in the final. I'm picking Florida because of their experience. They've been there before. The defending national champions. I picked Florida to win that game. 
See, I like George Mason as an 11 seed getting all the way to the Final Four. <laughs> all right. I should have okay. said that last you see, year. If you that would that only I'm going to go with Florida. I, I like Florida, Florida up stuff. top, and I think they're going to play Wisconsin. Now, I think Notre Dame, Hubert, is a great call, but I think Wisconsin, because of their defense, I think that's the best defensive team in the bottom of that bracket. Kansas and UCLA, I agree with you guys. The North Carolina, Georgetown. I've got Georgetown and Ohio State playing at the bottom, and Florida and Kansas playing at the top, and Kansas advancing. And I think Georgetown, because of the way they're playing, they're a little bit stronger. I like Kansas and Georgetown getting to the championship game. That's going to be a pretty strong final. All right, Dick Vitale, what do you think? Who do you have? Well, you know, all these guys make great picks. I like North Carolina in a battle with Georgetown. Two Goliaths going head-to-head. -head. I think that North Carolina prevails. I like in the other matchup, you got Ohio State, Texas A&M. I'm going to go with the Buckeyes. Odin and company defense prevails. And then I'm talking about Florida and Oregon. I'm going Gators, UCLA, Kansas. I'm going UCLA. And then it's going to be Carolina, UCLA. And it's going to be Carolina. Touch the nuts. What celebrate like they did in 2005. <laughs> That's Bracketology. The games start on Tuesday with the opening round game. The field of 65 in the drive toward Atlanta. For our entire game, I'm Reese Davis. We'll see you later.